How do you spend £16 billion to improve the world's health? Well, that's the job of Sir Jeremy Farah, the director of the Wellcome Trust. In 1936, British pharmaceutical magnate Sir Henry Wellcome left his fortune to improve the world's health. Now Sir Jeremy must work out what to do with it, specifically £16 billion over the next decade and how he can most effectively spend it. By background, he's a medical doctor and researcher. He's been named 12th in Fortune's list of the world's 50 greatest leaders, served in the UK Sage Group and was knighted in 2019 for his services to global health. I asked him about how he spends that money, how to measure philanthropic impact, problems and opportunities within research funding, and just how much of his job is just not messing things up. I hope you enjoy. How do you see the role of institutes like the Wellcome Trust in society? There are some people say that this kind of thing should be the jobs of governments. And in particular, I wanted to ask, is that kind of third space you sit in, is that something that unlocks new opportunities for you? Maybe you avoid some of the affiliations or the shackles of government or industry. Are there any new opportunities that it brings being in that kind of unique position? I think it does. Philanthropy is not government. It shouldn't supplant government. It shouldn't do what government should do. And yes, although welcome is big, um, it's the first, second or third biggest philanthropy in the world, depending on how you measure it. But you know, it, it's a big organization. But in the bigger scheme of things, it's very small. It doesn't have the resources that, that big governments, uh, big economies have. And so therefore, it, it's not about the scale it's at. It's about, in my view, the... Uh, I hope, the innovation it can bring, uh, the willingness to take risk, the willingness to work at interfaces which perhaps are harder to do in what can be more siloed and more fragmented agencies and, and what government can do. And, and, uh, and I think it's really important if you're given that privileged position, if you're in that degree of independence and, and freedom, it's really important to use that. Otherwise, why have it? Um, if, if you're in that position... I think there's a responsibility to say, what can we do that others might like to do, but perhaps can't for understandable constraints? And then how can we make the biggest contribution at the sort of scale we're at with the humility of knowing that we're not that big if we compare ourselves with, you know, the National Institutes of Health in the United States, I think off the top of my head, has got a budget of about $20 billion per year. Uh, European Union, the European Research Council, British government, Japanese government, German government. You know, these have resources beyond anything that philanthropy can bring. So it's not about scale. It's about doing things, I think, slightly differently and trying to be at the edge of what's possible rather than the midst of what's possible. Feel free to correct me on any of these assumptions because this almost has me wrong. But if we were to make a scale of appetite for risk um, as a funder of science and we assume that government tend to like safe projects and that industry... Uh, particularly some parts of industry, have a bigger appetite for risk. So if those are on two ends of the spectrum, where does welcome sit within that? Does your unique position mean that you can be a bit more tolerant to risk and go for those kind of moonshot projects, or is that not really the case? I think, yes, I think the simple answer is yes. Um, I think, but I, but I don't think it's, uh, and and I'm sure in the way you've asked the question, that, that nor do you, it, it it's not as polarized or as, clear cut as, as you describe. I think sometimes governments take great risks. I mean, if I if I pick out, for instance, uh, the DARPA organization in the United States set up in the 1950s or uh, President Kennedy's pledge in the early 1960s to get to the moon by, by the end of that decade, the uh, German government investments over many years in the basic science that led to the mRNA vaccines that we many of us have had through COVID or indeed the support from, from the UK, US government or the UK government for uh, the mRNA vaccines in the United States or the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine here. These are examples where the governments have taken risk and indeed companies have taken risk. Um, but I think where we are would be trying to identify opportunities where at the sort of scale we are at, i.e. bigger than many other philanthropies, but nowhere near the scale of government. How can we use that risk appetite, which I hope is is more, yes, uh, to be pushing the, the edges of what we do, to push the edges of the science that can be done, to ask the question, what if? What, what if you could do this? What if you could sequence the human genome in the last decade of the last century? And what if you could make that and put that into the public domain so that it wasn't patentable by people and therefore closed to, to not being accessible to everybody? What if you could change 
the research culture and the research environment so that diversity and inclusion and everybody could be themselves and bring themselves into that environment? What if you could ensure that the most affected communities, those with lived experience, were part of the research endeavour? Uh, what if you could stretch the edge of knowledge at the interfaces of disciplines rather than within disciplines? What if you could change the way that imaging was done or sequencing was done? These are the sorts of things that I think that's where philanthropy can play a critical catalytic role and then work in partnership with others to bring scale. Are there any parts of science funding, particularly across life sciences and, and medical research that frustrate you or in, in other words, where you see room for improvement or opportunities in, in ways that things could be done differently over the next few decades? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think I'm an internal optimist, but I'm also a frustrated optimist. Um, and and whilst I absolutely accept there are fantastic things that happen, we we should all acknowledge and 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 credit that the improvement. Uh, that has been made in the last 20, 30 years. Um, and I do believe now we're on the cusp of a, an incredible era of scientific enlightenment. But but I'm still frustrated, yes. I, I think that in no particular order, I, I think we, particularly in fact, I think in the UK, but I think this is a, a general global trend, we are forcing young people into, into very early specialisation. That's great for expertise of knowledge. That is great for the depth of knowledge. But what what I think we're now struggling with is is the interfaces between disciplines. Um, of course, multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity are words that are bandied around everywhere. But but I think if we push young people into becoming uh, a scientist or a humanities or a political expert or a social science expert, and we don't bridge those disciplines and respect them for what they can bring and and with the humility of what they can't bring. So it's at the interfaces that I think we have to do more to encourage disciplines to work together. I do worry that that we're making it harder in the early career of people than it was in my era um, as I was going through that as a, a, a young a clinical scientist. Um, yeah, there's many reasons for that, but it's harder to get those grants uh, and those awards and that recognition in your, I don't mean to be ageist, but in your 20s and 30s than I think it I felt it was uh, when I was at, at that stage in my career. So I, I would love to do more to encourage, if you like, the next generation of early career scientists across disciplines to be more, more widely. Um, and then I think the last one I'd say is, is I think science has become very short term. Uh, many grant awarding bodies around the world work now in two to four year cycles or five year cycles. That that's leading to cliff edges every three or four years when your next grant is due. And I would love to see us funding longer term and uh, allowing people to dream about what they would really like to do rather than what they can get through a funding panel. To pick up on your first point about generalism versus specialism, both in the context of science and scientists, but also in the context of your own career experience and life experience, if you had to pick a side... Do you think in today's society, generalism pays off more or specialism? I think within the scientific community now, specialism is is more of what is um, perhaps incentivized and, and encouraged. But I don't think the future is one or the other. Um, I don't think the future is either more and more deep specialization or more and more generalists, but without the expertise. I think the sweet spot is if we can break down the thinking that it's all about iconic experts, but it's about experts working together and respecting the interfaces. When I, I worked for a, a brilliant individual uh, in Edinburgh when I was uh, training in neurology, uh, a character called Charles Warlow. The thing he said to me in the late 1980s, and it still rings true with me today, is the really exciting places are when experts come together at the interfaces between their expertise. And they, they, whether both or more than that, they respect each other's deep expertise, but they're willing to work together at the interfaces. That's often difficult. It's difficult culturally. It's difficult for language. It's difficult for scientific endeavor. But I do think it's at that interfaces where people from a physics background or a social science background or a biomedical one or a clinical or non-clinical or, or from one geography or another geography, one culture or another culture, I think that's where major advances can happen uh, where we put aside our 
siloed nature and we we are willing to work in 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 the interfaces between disciplines that's what i think we could encourage more in the scientific endeavor but whilst respecting the deep expertise uh, i don't think the future is all about the generalist I think it's about getting experts to work together at the interfaces. I speak to a lot of people in industry, people in venture capital, people running startups. And, you know, this isn't very accurate, but the caricature at least is of move fast and break things and scale, scale, scale and move quickly, quickly, quickly. Ask for forgiveness, not permission. In your own context with the funding you do and the, and the other bits of work you do, um, my perception, at least, is that you move a lot slower than that. And that, say, from idea to conception to making it reality or ending up in uh, helping patients, there's a very, very delayed time scale there. Are there things that you, you know, from your position that you've picked up on that thinking like, hey, we could do this a bit quicker or we should do this a bit differently? Yes, I do. I do share. I, I do agree with that. And actually, I think the experience the last couple of years has demonstrated that if you want to and if there's a need to, you can disrupt things without breaking them. Uh, you can constructively disrupt things and you can do things, what I would say, in parallel rather than than in sequence. Um, one of the actually things that I certainly would be certainly proud of, if not, yeah, maybe the, one of the most proud things I've done in, in the time uh, with colleagues at Welcome and with colleagues now around the world is to establish something that we called Welcome Welcome Leap, um, which is run by a brilliant individual, uh, Regina Dugan, in actually based in the United States and Ken Gabriel based in the United States. And they both came out of the DARPA model. And the DARPA model is to uh, sort of put out a, a challenge which which one feels is is preventing progress in an area of science. But if you could crack that, if you could ask the question, what if we could do that? Would it open up not just for the people working within the community now addressing that, but it would open up a whole a whole field of new endeavour. Um, and I think that we we are now in the last few years, and we've been going with this for about two or three years now. So it's very early in its in its evolution. But but I think. Asking the question, what if, through Welcome Leap, with about 3 or 5% of our overall funding. So, so it's a completely different approach. It's much faster. Uh, it's trying to address some of the challenges and the slowness that you, you say, which is that we, you know, it's not just about the science. It's also about the contracts um, a funder has with universities or academic institutions or even and with companies. But by saying this is our contract, if you want to join with us in doing this sort of work, just sign up to this. And then we remove all of the contractual negotiations that have to go on. And we all accept that's the way we do things. And then to get a network of people together working from around the world to put aside their institutional and individual uh, egos, in a sense, and say we can achieve far more if we work together. And, and I think that's been a really exciting, constructive, disruptive model to the way that we fund science. It may not be work for everything. But I think it works for some things very well. Sorry, just so I understand that. So uh, Welcome Leap essentially says, look, there's this field and here's this big problem that if we solve, we could make a lot of progress. And let's just put out a bounty to, to solve this problem. Is, is that correct? That, that's correct. So it, it, it's over a period of time. It's not a short, it's not a prize. It's about creating a network of around the world, which can see that if one worked from Stanford in the United States with the University of Melbourne in Australia, Singapore, Dundee, wherever it might be, uh, you could crack a you could crack a problem. For instance, I was listening to one this week about how could you use experience from the semiconductor industry, uh, which went to miniaturization and fluid dynamics, in order to create much faster mRNA for vaccines or therapeutics. This is a partnership between Welcome Leap and and CEPI, which is dedicated to vaccines for uh, emerging pathogens. Could we use the experience of the semiconductor industry? to create a fluid dynamics process for making mRNA more standardized, more modular, uh, smaller scale, but higher volume and reduce costs. That's bringing together expertise from semiconductors, from fluid dynamics, from vaccinology, from virus and uh, mRNA technology chemistry in a network of multiple people all around the world. I mean, incredibly exciting. If you could crack that, mRNA technology for therapeutics for the future would open up in a whole new way in a whole new field uh, beyond anything we can actually think about today. And it's that sort of challenge. Let's create, let's find a technological or other solution to this. And then let's see what that may open up in ways that we can't necessarily yet predict. 
Being able to tell a good story, being a good salesperson, that seems like an important skill in raising grant funding or any kind of funding. I just wanted to ask you in your experience, have you found that projects that are sexy and promise big things or the projects that are more boring and perhaps more incremental, have you had any sway on which one tends to achieve better results or help humanity more? Have you have you felt any 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 leaning towards one or the other? No, I don't have a leaning because I actually think both are important. And I, and I think the way of phrasing it is critical because some of the greatest advances, I mean, if you, if you take, I don't want to focus too much on, on COVID in the last two or three years because there are lessons and there, sometimes there's too many lessons trying to be learned. But, but what we should remember is, is the mRNA vaccines that, that have made such a difference to this pandemic. I mean, um, it's unthinkable that if we went back to the pre-vaccine era, really, and the mortality rates and from COVID. And everybody sees the mRNA vaccines uh, coming out of BioNTech and Moderna and others as being something that happened in one or two years during the pandemic. The, the truth is that that is not true. It was actually because of incredible investment over a 20, 25 year period in very basic science with people working on mRNA from a chemistry, a physics, a biology perspective, making what you would might describe as incremental progress, but incremental progress that was absolutely critical in 2020 to then saying this could be used to make the vaccine for COVID in a fast way and in a way that could be scaled very quickly. So the sexiness and the impact that drove the COVID vaccines through 2021 actually built off 20, 30 years of very basic, non-implement, non apparently non-impactful um, progress, which one might describe as incremental, and there were many mistakes made along the route, but that laid the foundation for why we've had vaccines in the last two years. And we shouldn't just focus on the last two years of investment in that mRNA vaccine technology. We should appreciate that it came off the back of uh, two or three decades of investment in basic science. So I spoke to uh, Fiona Godley about a year ago, who was then editor-in-chief of the BMJ. And the question I asked her was, how much of your job is doing good stuff versus how much of your job is coming in and just not messing things up? Because you're inheriting a huge uh, brand, a behemoth organization. Like how much of, how much of you know, on the first day are they just saying, just, just don't mess anything up. Just keep, keep, the, keep the boat running, keep the ship sailing. I haven't seen Fiona Godley for a very long time, but actually she was uh, a year... I think ahead of me in at, at university at, at University College London um, as an undergraduate. Don't mess him up. I think uh, <laughs> is not is not a perspective I would I would like to bring. I I I think of course one should never disrupt things and and mess good things up. But everywhere can improve. Um, you know there is nowhere that is perfect. And I think philanthropy perhaps because it doesn't have the market drivers, the commercial drivers, it doesn't have the political uh, waves that come and go and sort of force change. Philanthropy does need to be critical of itself and say, we're in this amazing position. We're in this very privileged and lucky position. Therefore, we've really got to ask ourselves, how can we use that responsibility in the best way for the greatest number of, of people uh, around the world? And, and so I think philanthropy has to be really self-critical there's not necessarily a burning platform. There is, you know, you're giving out money. Uh, that's a positive thing to do. It's critical to ask yourself the question, could we do more? Could we have greater impact either in the long term or in the shorter term? Can we use our privileged position and the responsibility that comes with it to have an even bigger contribution? And I think it's critical to not mess things up, but it's also critical to challenge oneself and say, could we do more? Particularly in the philanthropic world where the, you do not have those commercial drivers, you don't have shareholders, you don't have competitors in that same way, you don't have that political expediency of, of elections and things. And so I think it's critical that philanthropy brings a critical role and is constructively disruptive and makes change. And it's always better and sort of very strong feeling throughout my career has been it's always better to change before you need to feel you need to change. It's always better to change when you're ahead of the curve rather than reacting to outward forces that may be forcing you to change. Think ahead. Don't get complacent with where you are. In terms of impacting the world in a good way, are there ways or are there certain metrics that you've landed on as useful ways of measuring that or seeing the impact of what you're doing? I mean, there's I've heard of qualities, so quality adjusted life years, 
there are some interesting moves towards um, global happiness indexes, I think, or mm-hmm. instead of GDP, basically for a, for a country, you have the happiness index instead. I was just wondering if you had any kind of interesting spins on that or, or, or ways in which you like to measure your impact or your organization's impact. Yeah, the ability to, to measure impacts, I think, again, it goes back to the, 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 the self-critique, I think. It, it, is, it, is, it is a really important thing to do, and it's very complex. But one shouldn't be intimidated by that complexity and say, therefore, it's not possible, um, because I think that's 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 not being responsible. But I don't think there's a single measure that you're in a in a, any complex environment or complex where it's not just science or research. It's it's almost in every sector. There, there's very few places trying to do complex things where you'll just have a single metric. You're not making widgets in a factory and and it's how many widgets you make and how many can you sell them for. And I think the the danger of being um, uh, overly measured is the sense that you'll you'll be incentivized towards things that are easy to measure and maybe short term. I think in the end, you do have to have a, I hate to use the word, but a portfolio of approaches that are saying, yeah, we want to have an impact tomorrow in a fast moving, pandemic situation, we want to get a vaccine quickly. But we also want to make sure that we're changing the research environment that we work in, that we make it more equitable and diverse and inclusive, that we are thinking about people who do not have a voice in marginalized communities. And we're thinking about the impact of our work, not just next year, but 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now. And I think that means a more nuanced, uh, it means a more a sophisticated way of looking at your impact whilst not dodging the question that you do have to know you are driving impact. One of my worries in the way research funding is done globally is that we are increasingly, uh, I think governments are increasingly driving towards shorter term impact and missing this sense that actually you'll drive impact uh, over the longer term as well by doing some of the, the very basic discovery science that is so critical to the underpinning of future uh, advances. Well, is that a role for you then that you are outside of these kind of four or five year election cycles and that you, you at your organization can be playing the long game? It is. That, that, it is. It's the balance of that whilst also having the impatience and frustration that you want to make a difference tomorrow because there are some really pressing challenges. Climate change, uh, the mental health of young people is, I think, neglected and we've made no progress. That's a deep, deep frustration that can't wait 30 years because, you know, young people need to know that if they're developing or have a mental health condition which is holding them back, that there is something that's going to come in a faster time period than, as you asked earlier, 20 or 30 years from now. But we also must lay down the discovery of things that we can't yet predict where they'll have an impact over the long term. I think an organization such as Welcome, which is, as I said, not big enough to do everything, but is big enough to do some things, can take that uh, that balance of the urgency of tomorrow uh, with the long-term laying down of science that might have an impact, we hope, in 20, 30 or 40 years of even greater scale. But whilst the boss at the widget factory can look to the big board and say, we made a thousand widgets today versus 500 yesterday, that's improvement. Yourselves with the kind of portfolio of indices that you're measuring, isn't one of the problems that you can kind of spin it either way at the end of the year, you've got a thousand metrics you're measuring, you can spin whatever story you want out of it. So essentially my question to you is like, how, how do you actually know that you're doing a good job? Yeah, it's, I I can't give you a a simple answer to it. I, 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 and I probably don't wish I could, but, but I think it is a really important question and it, and it's wrong to, if, although you may accuse me of it, it's wrong to dodge it because we must be held accountable. We must be transparent about, how we're spending the money and why we're spending the money on what we're spending it on and what impact that is that is having. So, of course, we gather an enormous amount of data. Um, just as given you an example of that, for instance, we with um, something called the World Mosquito Project, which is looking at, at can we reduce uh, infections like dengue fever around the world or yellow fever or uh, Japanese encephalitis by by working on the mosquito to prevent to pre- prevent transmission. We can measure that. We can measure how much it reduces the incidence of dengue. We can measure the millions of people in the world that will therefore not have to live in a dengue endemic world, and that's very measurable. We can measure the number of people that that, that are alive today 
or not getting sick because of artemisinin in combination therapy for the treatment of malaria that became WHO guidelines in about 2010 and reduced mortality by 35 or, or so percent. So there are some very specifics that you can say, because Welcome, in partnership with others, did those two things. Hundreds of millions of people are not living in dengue endemic areas or have not died from malaria. That's great and it's easy to do. What is much harder to do is to say we invested, and uh, in the place I'm sitting in now, the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, we did a third of the human genome at the turn of the century. That has transformed science. Um, it's allowed mRNA technology to be developed to make a COVID vaccine. It's allowed understanding of rare diseases or the origins of cancer. That will affect hundreds of millions of people over decades. But nobody will go back and say it happened because of the human genome. But we know it did. And I think somehow we have to be sophisticated enough to appreciate and understand both of those and appreciate that both are important. But I, you know, I, I have huge respect for the widget factory owner, and it's critical that she or he makes a thousand today compared with 500 yesterday because widgets are crucially important. I think we have to accept that we do have a harder job to measure our impact, but we shouldn't shy away from saying we're investing in this because we want to have that sort of impact over that sort of time frame. Do you think that in the near future, let's say in a time frame of two decades or three decades, do you think there's potential for an AI to take over your job or at least the role of directing funds towards science? Because hmm. some of the problems that we've talked about within funding do come down to the human factors and bias biases and, and yeah. other, other things. So I don't know. Do, do you think that's realistic? Do you hmm. think AI will ever, will ever uh, take over your job? <laughs> I've never been asked that question before. Um, and my knowledge of AI is, is, I'm afraid, not where I would wish it to be. Um, uh, I am quite sure that um, AI and all that lies behind it of better access to data, better use of data, better uh, uh, responsibility of using data could play a much bigger role than it currently does in trying to identify fields of research, horizon scanning, uh, contributions that people have made or where the science might be going and all of that sort of work. I think in the end, though, there is a responsibility of the human factor and the accountability that comes with that, that ultimately there's a judgment call to be made, that you can be led down a path, but you've then got to make a decision between A, B, C, D, Z, whatever it might be. And ultimately, I think that still needs a judgment call of, of a human input. Um, maybe I'm old fashioned. Um, maybe, you know, growing up in the 20th century, um, uh, somebody younger than me would say, yeah, oh, that's just last century thinking. But I think ultimately there's still a human judgment call to be made between competing priorities and then to be held accountable for those decisions that are made. I want to get your thoughts on this Nassim Taleb quote. And this is more from the lens of personal philanthropy. But his, his quote is essentially, uh, first become a king before becoming a philosopher. <laughs> and the the thing that the, the learning that I took away from that is essentially that before, you know, if you're a young person and you're worrying about changing the world and having a good impact on the world, it's probably more important for you to work on getting into a, a good role in society, getting financially secure. And then, you know what, you can actually have an impact based on what your philosophies are. What what are your thoughts to that? Hmm. So this is a very instinctive response. And I'd, I'd, I'd love to have come back to you having seen that before. I would, I would actually disagree with you instinctively on that, but I, it's a, I would like to think about it more. But I think if you don't have a, whether you're a, a widget factory owner or you're um, a king or prince or, or prime minister or president, or you're running Welcome, or you're a, a junior doctor or a researcher, I mean, you've got to have some thing that drives you. I, I, I mean, that's what I would regard as a philosophical underpinning. You've got to have something which gets you out of bed every day and thinks this is what your values are. This is your philosophy. This is what you're, you're trying to do in your role, whatever your role may be. And I think those probably remain pretty consistent through your life. Of course, they will be influenced by many others. And, you know, there's a wonderful poem that, that, that is, um, you know, I'm part of all that I have met. Um, everybody has an influence on you for good and bad, but there's an underpinning philosophy, which I think is pretty consistent through life. And if you don't have that, I think you have no compass. You have no 
you're a butterfly and and if you just want power or money for the sake of it but you don't have that underpinning drive of values and philosophy then then i think you're sort of rudderless a bit throughout your career have there been any habits or ways you like to approach problems or just any things that you do that you think have been helpful in getting you to where you are today i think i think having experienced failure is important and having the support from others uh, to appreciate that that failure is not not def- uh, hope, hopefully and uh, no, I appreciate this is not for everybody, but but because I've been very lucky. But 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 failure is not is not an end, and and you and you can recover from it, and and actually you certainly will learn something from it. I think it's critical in in whatever you do, however busy you are, stressed you are. It's critical to have some way you can go, which takes you out of that, which is a different space, which is somewhere where you can take that coat off and put a different one on because we all have you know we're everybody in every role uh has tremendous pressures and stresses on them from whatever sources family work work life balance whatever it is just crucial that you have somewhere which is yours which you can go to in a sense and and have some space to yourself and and in a way protect yourself because that that is that is crucial um and then i think it it for me, it's about being a yeah, an optimist, um, but being a frustrated optimist. That actually, you 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 can, if you're in a privileged position like I am, and you have a degree of authority or power because of of whatever fortunes you've had, you then have a responsibility to use it. And so I worry less about just don't mess it up. To what can we do to make it even better? Um, and not everybody uh, appreciate will will want or like or 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 respect you for that that desire to be a constructive disruptor but but i think it's critical because otherwise the world won't make progress in the context of you being able to find you know a space to go chill out um, and get away from mm. any failures and stuff are you are you like a famous person would you say because you're a, certainly a public figure especially in in this space of health health and life sciences do you get spotted on the street do you ever does, does that ever happen do you ever feel like you lost a bit of your privacy or is that not really a thing i have never thought of myself as a famous person I, i'm not quite sure what a famous person is i mean i when you say that what comes to my mind it comes my mind comes to either a um a sports person or a film star or or a, a politician or prime minister or 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 a, or a great artist or i don't know what or a ballet dancer you know those are that's fame or, or somebody from Big Brother or something. Um, no, I don't regard myself as a, a famous person at all. Over the last two, three years, there have been some extraordinary difficult times through COVID. I appreciate that. Um, and there have been some very, very difficult times in terms of both. Yes, it's been positive. There's been a lot of people that have been very generous and kind and and uh, and have um, been in touch or commented or stopped me a yes in the street and said thank you for what you've done and whatever in, in over the last two or three years but there's been a, a darker side to that as well and there's been uh yeah a lot of social uh, abuse on social media um and and physical and 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 other threats which have been which have been um yeah at times very difficult to to work quite how to deal with and that's been very something different in the last two or three years that's um at times been very disturbing. I want to ask you about your book or resource recommendations. Yeah. And in particular, I know that you're someone who has a very, very broad and uh, cross-disciplinary understanding of the sciences and, and, and such. So is there anything that comes to mind in terms of a book that you'd recommend that's maybe a bit weird, like maybe it weirdly relates to healthcare, but it's something outside of that space? Um, just one. <laughs> um, as many as you like. Um, th- there's somebody that, that I have been um privilege to get to know just a little bit over the last few years actually and is um a turkish i think turkish british writer called called ella shafiq um she has a very small book she has a lot of books um two books i would really recommend from her one is is uh, how to stay sane in an age of division um it's an optimistic take it's an acceptance that the world is fragmented and divided at the moment but it's how we could as an individual a family, a society, how we could move through that to try and break down some of those divisions. And it's it's just a, a very small book, um, beautifully written, um, and and comes from a background of somebody that has been at the interfaces from Turkey, of Asia, Europe, of sexuality, of of, of gender issues, of 
of growing up in a in a in a complex society and uh I would highly recommend her books to anybody. There's another beautiful one, um, The Island of Missing Trees, um, about a love affair in Cyprus between the Cypriot and Turkish communities and a, and a fig tree um, and a daughter that comes from the love affair. Just beautiful books of the interfaces of cultures and the interfaces of what's possible and, um, and dreaming. I hope you enjoyed that episode. You can find all my links by going to bigpicturemedicine.co.uk. And if you've been enjoying the podcast, then please consider leaving a review. And by the way, all of these episodes are now available on YouTube and on Spotify in video format. Thanks for listening.